appreciate. I'm delighted to be here today. Um, it's wonderful. I've always loved to spend time with young people and engineers, especially um, to hear your creative ideas. So I'm going to keep this very casual, very conversational, talk story, if you will. Um, I really want to say thanks to Josh who gave me an outline for my remarks. It was the most organized um, outline I've ever gotten when I've been asked to give <laughs> presenting remarks. So um, thank you. So you just framed my speech. So a little bit about me. Um, I think I'm a third generation feminist. Um, my Both my grandmothers, sadly, uh, my grandfathers died before I was born. And both my grandmothers took over their husband's businesses. Uh, unheard of at that time and that day. And in fact, my grandmother Wilkins was the first woman ever for General Motors to transfer a Chevrolet franchise to in its history. Now, not because they were really progressive and really thought that she could probably be up for the task as a woman, but because my father was a decorated pilot and she was going to hold it until my dad um, came home from service. Um, my father would be the first person to tell you that my mother, who was an accountant, one of the first um, in her era, was the singular driving force behind the success of his business. So um, I stand on the shoulders of many great women. I am a product of the 20th century women's movement. When I was a girl in school, some of the landmark legislation had already been passed. Title IX from our Patsy Mink from Maui, uh, Roe v. Wade, several EEOC um, laws that prevented gender discrimination and hiring practices were already passed. Now, just because the legislation is in place doesn't mean the implementation follows so smoothly. So I think still today in 2023, we have work to do on gender parity. Um, my upbringing is from a very small town in the Midwest, um, but I really think that the values that I was brought up with really prepared me for living now 40 years at Maui, the only place I've lived in my adult life out of school, paying my own rent and paying my way, has been on Maui. Um, Dean Maroka, I shared a story of how I got to Maui, and it's on my talking points, so he's already heard it, so here it goes. So my husband and I got married right out of school and um, we were, um, I'm from the Midwest, um, from Illinois, Iowa. My husband's a Denver native. We met at school and um, he, we were waiting for bar results. He's an attorney. We we're waiting for his bar results and we we're having this poll. My parents, of course, wanted us to settle in Des Moines and his parents wanted us back in Denver. So we went off on our honeymoon, not making commitments to some job offers that we had in both those places. And um, our last leg was um, beautiful Maui, which captured our hearts. We're staying in a hotel. Now it's the Wailea Marriott. It was then Intercontinental. And it was this little shopping center, not the big fancy shops of Wailea now. It was wooden, had an ABC store, and it had a little branch of First Wine Bay. And so we thought, well, what if we just stayed for the winter? We got married in September. We could figure out what we wanted to do then when we grew up. We could, you know, this family push thing. We could know bar results for my husband, that kind of thing. And so um, my husband went in to apply for a clerk job. And the um, then the late Judge Uyoka fell in love with my husband. He too had gone to a small school in the Midwest for his law degree. And they talked story forever. And, you know, he was hired on the spot after checking some references and the Uyoka family really adopted us. So I went into the bank and I ready for this. I cashed an American Express travel check. Do you even know what that is? I mean, there were no ATMs at the time at all. Um, so that was our wedding money. We had been given some traveler's checks and there was a man sitting at the desk in the lobby, which I assumed was the branch manager. So I thought, well, my summer jobs have been working in a bank. You know, most people take, especially on the continent when it's cold in the winter, most people take their vacations in summer. So my summer job, I'd been a teller one summer. I'd helped open accounts. I processed loans. Quite a broad experience because I would sit in for people that were on vacation, right? 
So I sat down and I said, sir, I was just wondering if you had any openings at the branch. I've got quite a bit of experience in banking and I would like to apply. Well, this is a funny story. Um, the late Mr. Watanabe, bless his soul, was not much of a conversationalist. So, or did he have a lot of, I guess, just, you know, general manners at, at when he was right to the point. So he turned his back on me, dug through his credentials, and he pulled out this application. I'm not kidding. It was yellow and dog-eared. And I'm like, <laughs> oh, I'm filling it out. And I'm like, so I have references, but they're on the continent. You know, it's about a five-hour time zone, whatever. And he, you know, kind of grunted at me and grabs it back, turns his back on me and calls from, you know, what I figured out was HR, obviously, here in Honolulu. And <laughs> talked to him full on pigeon, saying, Got me one holly girl here. Seems pretty, plenty smart. Seems like all the retaliates out here are like are playing good. <laughs> <laughs> so I didn't know what that meant, if that was good, bad, <laughs> different, if I had a shot at this or not. So, so lo and behold, um, you know, they did have faxes then. Those were invented. So I'm sure you faxed my um, application into HR personnel here in Honolulu. And he said, Come back in three days. So, you know, I came back in three days, probably with another American Express traveler's check to cash. And so I got hired. And the reason I got hired is dumb Hallie girl, actually. Nobody who works at a bank could afford to live in Wailea to work at that branch with the salary that you get working in a branch bank. <laughs> so um, he was having a really hard time himself finding a replacement for him and finding um, staff. So lo and behold, that was my first job. And um, we just were going to pass out towels and, uh, towels and sunscreens if that's what we had to do but we were not going to write home for money. We we're absolutely not going to uh, call up because we already knew that they would think we were grossly irresponsible, which we kind of were. And, um, <laughs> and they worked hard to help with our education. So our first fight, as I told Dean Maroka, was you call your parents. No, you call your parents first. <laughs> and um, this is a big thing that enabled it, which will not happen today. Actually, I'm not recommending this course of action because it's financially not feasible, is that United Airlines, when you canceled your return flight back then, they gave you money back. So we used that cash for our first month's rent on a condo um, studio. And are you ready for this? $529 a month plus utilities. It was like this big and it had a pull-out couch for a bed, but it had a bathroom and a kitchen and quite functional. And it was... Um, in Kihei and not too far a drive before the highway down the bumpy little Kihei road for me to get to Wailea for branch banking and for um, my husband to get to the courthouse in Wailuku. So that is my crazy story. And 40, now four decades later, um, I just went home and I've had three amazing careers there, which I will go through because that's all my talking points that I'm supposed to say. So, um, one of the questions is, what values did I have growing up and what values today? And I think those always respect, um, respect those that are in your life, um, respect what people say, even though you disagree vehemently with where they're coming from, their philosophy, um, but respect them as a human being. And um, I think that's needed today more than ever because civility and kindness are so important. And um, so, you know, in the Midwest, people were kind and gentle and cared and, you know, brought casseroles over, you know, just like we bring over, you know, um, Simon, you know, here. So it's like, it's always um, caring for others. And I really am happy that I live in a community. But what has really been the greatest, wonderful journey for me is where I grew up, it was a monoculture. You know, we really did not have the beautiful diversity that Hawaii brings. My parents worked hard to drive to Chicago, to the Art Institute of Chicago or whatever, you know, cultural musical thing was happening there. And they would drive to St. Louis for the Muni Opera to try to give us culture. But the fact that I live in a place which is the beautifully most diverse state in the nation, um, I've learned so much. My daughter, born and raised here, celebrates every possible thing. She, you know, we eat um, 
money soup after midnight um, on New Year's Eve. We celebrate Chinese New Year. Uh, we don't spend money on New Year's because if you spend money on New Year's, you're going to have Apple of cash. Um, you know, we had a first baby luau. So, I mean, every single culture that we celebrate is just a part of my daughter's heritage. She doesn't know any better, but that's just part of what her life is. So I, I'm so blessed for that. So um, education, I am not an engineer. And one of the reasons I'm passionate about getting women into engineering, I don't see this often, but I did like really, really well on my math SATs. Okay, on the English, you know, part of it, but never, ever did, uh, and I'm a pretty good student, and never did one of my counselors, one of my teachers ever say, Leslie, have you ever thought about engineering? You're really creative, you're a leader, you know, and have you ever thought any field in science? No one ever said that, but because I kind of present verbally, okay, I talk a lot, um, I got pushed into what would one would say social work or um, you know helping community business things all excellent careers don't get me wrong but you know talk about a different a generational difference um, we were pushing then women to go into law and a little bit more into the biological sciences into um, maybe pharmacy and medicine of course nursing still the standard right and so. So anyway, that's why opening up all the doors and pathways, um, no matter what gender, is so important that you know we should not be having any of those lingering old stereotypes that I face. Even though you know I I um, I, I benefited from uh, Gloria Steinem and Betty Friedan and um, actually um, the the tennis player Billie Jean King um, when she. Um, really advocated for women's sports. My very first bet ever, as I think I was in middle school, I bet uh, one of the boys in my class that she could beat then. There was this big thing about, um, what's his name, Jimmy, Billy, what was his? Anyway, he was a kind of a washed up old male tennis player, but he was bound and determined that he wanted to set the stage of this against the genders, right? Billie Jean King, who amazing, phenomenal, opened up professional sports for women in tennis. And um, I think I bet $5, which was big. It was like allowance um, that she would win. And I won. And the funny thing is, is I had to speak at a women's conference not too long ago. And they told me to say some funny anecdote about my youth. And I used that one. And there were two sixth grade girls and the, I love this. I hope it never becomes part of your vocabulary. He didn't know what the word chauvinist was for chauvinist pig. They were, I heard them Googling how to pronounce it to read that about me. So I hope that it's forever stricken from our vocabulary. So um, my education is political science and public administration. Um, I thought that I would go in to be an amazing agency administrative worker, but I graduated during the Reagan administration. And if we thought we have inflation now, whoa. Um, interest rates, um, uh, the only reason that we can even think of buying a house was because one of the um, perks of working for the bank is you've got an employee interest rates for your mortgage. And you know what a preferential interest rate was then? 14%. <laughs> That was preferential. The going rate to just clients was about 16 to 18%. Um, there was, you know, over 20% sometimes in um, interest. So, so for car loans and other consumer loans, so, and huge government cuts. Uh, that was the signature of the Reagan administration. Um, I could vote then and I did not vote for him. But um, anyway, so I'm speaking as a private citizen, not the CEO of MEB, which of which we are neutral on political things. Um, so, so yeah, so no, no government hiring. So see, one of my message is sometimes those summer jobs, which aren't really relevant to what you think you want to do in real life, are really handy at some point in time in your career to define you as a candidate um, to, for a job that, you know, you may not have thought was a fit, but ends up, you know, being something that charted your course. I worked for the bank for 
um, 10 years. And uh, what's really emotional for me right now is um, where I made officer with the bank because so I was a manager at the Lahaina branch. I started with Leia, went to Kukulani, then went to Lahaina. And um, Lahaina and Waikiki branches at the time were not known as the most desirable places to go because they're hard branches, right? High tourist, um, high turnover, hard to keep staffing. But I think they were going to send this, you know, girl there. My, I was under 30 then. Most of my peers were 55-year-old Asian men. So I think it was my proving. Let's see what she can do. Can she survive there? I know that's why they sent me there. I learned so much there. You're asked what I learned. I learned my work ethic. Um, we had to get there at 5 in the morning to open up the safe deposit box. Um, with, I mean, where everyone, excuse me, the safe deposit vault where people would put knife bags. You don't have to do that now because everything's so electronic. At the time when you ran a credit card, it was this paper thing that you had to deposit mm -hmm. and all the cash. And so we would open up the knife and the bags would knock us over. And we had to count all that cash down before and get it in the vault before we open at 30, right? Because Lahaina and what he had the highest robbery instance, right, throughout the chain. So those women were in their 50s. They had worked there since they were, there were like seven of them that had worked there since they were 19, since they graduated. And then the other staff, you know, we got them the last two weeks, we were lucky in Lahaina because of the high turnover. And they taught me my work ethic. They were kind, they were gentle. They were my mentors. I was their boss, but they were my mentors. And the financing of all those homes, those were our clients, those were, you know, homes that we help finance. And so it's a very emotional time for me and my career pathway because I have branch. It's where I made officer with the bank. Um, has such a special location. I live in Wailuku, so my home is safe. My husband's law practice is in Wailuku. My office is in the Research and Tech Park in Kihei. So physically, we're fine. But all of Maui, of course, um, is mourning in some sense of the way and uh, are rallying to, to work. So it's the first phase of my career. The second phase of my career, you want me to tell you what was the biggest leap I took? Well, let's see. I have a paycheck every two weeks. I had a preferred mortgage rate because I was an employee. Um, I um, had a pension. I had health care. And I decided when I made 10 years, that's how long you had to work back in the day to be vested. Don't I, Now it's really my turn. I decided it's time to open my own business. So um, I did that mainly because I wrote grants in public administration. You learn how to write grants and manage public funding and projects and community building. So that's, you know, that's what I actually studied and I had interns doing that, but I had never worked in it, right? So I thought I had gotten like 20 invitations to sit on boards of directors because I had sat on a couple and I voluntarily wrote grants. And, you know, Maui is a small place and the coconut wireless is really big. I guess they heard, she writes grants, she writes grants. So <laughs> I had like 20 invitations to sit on boards of directors. So I decided, you know what? I am going to try to make a business of this. So I did. And that was the next almost 10 years. So where I learned my leadership skills, where I mentioned that I'm a part of the 20th century women's movement. And so a lot of organizations evolved at that time. Uh, Business and Professional was one of them. American Association of University Women is another. Um, all of them were at their peak in, I think, the 80s and 90s. And uh, because, you know, there was momentum, there was so much to do. And, you know, that's where I learned my leadership skills and that was, so I started up the ladder in business and professional women. And um, I was like the Maui president of our little club. And then I was elected as state uh, president and I am honored and I'm deeply humbled that I'm a protege of the late Patsy Meek. Patsy Meek was a 35 year member of the business and professional the Honolulu club chapter. And again, I guess because I present verbally, I can talk a lot. Um, 
she and Velma Santos came to me and said, you know, we haven't had um, anyone from Hawaii in national office of ecodosis. Um, you know, um, the late Kehlani Deshay, and um, she's quite senior, she's a big island from Hawaii, brilliant woman. And um, we think that we need another one, and it's your turn. And they have made me learn parliamentary procedure. Do you even know what that is, Robert's Rules Parliamentary Procedure? We hated it. All I wanted to do when it came to GPW service, I wanted, what's the next policy issue? How can we, you know, write, write testimony? What legislators do we need to go see? But they always, Patsy and Velma, always made us young things. We were the young ones then. If that's, I know that's hard to imagine now, but at one point in time, I did have brunette hair. Um, anyway, he us do these workshops and practice ranking motions and, you know, how to do it. And, and um, I just thought, this is so boring. But, you know, they had to do that because they were, you know, singular voices in Congress and on county council. And that's how they got their voices heard. It's because they knew how to out-procedure the men and could gavel them down. Boy, am I glad I learned those procedures. They have served me well when I've chaired boards. I had to chair this board, which will rename, not, well, it will be nameless because some of the people that are on it are still alive. And um, and it was a 41 member board the governor had appointed me to. And some of the people on it hated each other and would do anything to be mean. And boy, was I glad I learned how to gavel people down and call them out of order and say, is there a motion in that? If not, you're out of order. Um, so, so anyway, Patsy Mink put her name on my brochure to run for office for business and professional women at a national conference, you know, we'll go up the ladder or ran for secretary, then a second vice president and a third vice president, president elect. And she was there and, and, you know, let's face it, a woman of that magnitude in the women's community, you know, that gave me a big leg up to have her name and face on my um, brochure. So, you know, that is, you know, where I think I learned my leadership skills. And that led me to my third career. Again, being in the right place at the right time. Um, I was in DC a lot. Um, my daughter was born and uh, she came with me. She was well-traveled. And I thought, this is a professional woman can accommodate working women. We are a fraud and a sham because much of our policy work was on that. And um, so that is how I came to MEDB. Um, I was working, I was sat on a committee from NSF because I was in National Office for BW to, about the underrepresentation of women in the STEM fields and what we do uh, to bring more women into STEM fields. And you know, I would check in routinely with congressional delegations. Lake Center and Roy have gotten an earmark uh, to bring more girls and women into STEM. And um, uh, it was, he wanted to place it with uh, my client. Now I have not a board, I've been writing grants for them. And so of course I would have to come in house uh, to direct that and become an FDA full-time employee. And um, the uh, first woman president of the organization was just coming into power and she hired me uh, to run this grant. And so here I am now president and CEO of that. And that is my career in a nutshell. And um, I hope it wasn't too terribly boring. And I commend everything you're doing. And I was asked to end with what can you to help um, as engineers with a particular case study of what could you do to help Maui in his recovery. And I'm making a plea here from the heart. I can't think of any other profession that is needed to help us rebuild Lahaina um, than your future profession and the skills that you're learning. Critical thinking, problem solving, working interdisciplinary. Um, that is what it's going to take. My job is going to be listening and lifting up the voices of community because Kapuna have to be heard and how do we restore the cultural assets? And some that had already been, you know, um, actually destroyed because of visitors. And just how can we restore those? You know, how can there be some light in, in this tragedy? The residents of Lahaina, um, how can we make sure they still have a place to live there? And how can we support them through the process? How can I get them resources and access? That's my job. Your job 
is to see as you design and as we rebuild the energy infrastructure, and we want to go into renewable energy. I've been totally not even subtle in trying to recruit her um, to um, come support. Um, whether it's rebuilding the energy infrastructure, the roads, making sure um, the land is safe for building, all of that is going to be a long process. You will definitely be into your career pathways. It's, you know, probably at best a 10 year version. So um, staying here in Hawaii and giving your skills, there is your needed at home. And I guess my last thing that why I do what I do is that I really want to stop the brain drain. Um, that's the common term for the fact that we are not keeping our bright young people here at home. Um, you know, the continent is cheaper. There's more housing on the continent. The ninth island of Vegas has, you know, big homes and swimming pools and a much cheaper rate. And, you know, there's culturally, um, you know, so many Hawaiians there that there's great Hawaiian <clears throat> culture there. It's uh, very seductive. But um, we um, need you. We suffered a great uh, migration during the pandemic. Um, and now it's projected Maui um, is going to be even a greater um, out migration just because of the length of time it's going to take to rebuild and um, all that needs to be done. But um, this is your home. You are your legacy. You are the ones who will perpetuate our culture, our values. Um, it's your amazing, you're not all your critical thinking and new ideas that will make Hawaii a better place. So, so anyway, am I done? Did I get all my bullet points in, John? Yeah, you did awesome. Thank you. <laughs> so, I love to answer any questions that you have. I think. Um, we have a little bit more time, right? Um, I'd like to start off with our first question. Um, it's how do you maintain a healthy balance between all of your big responsibilities and your life outside of work? Like, do you have any hobbies that you like to have to unwind or take your mind off of things? So, boy, is that ever the salient question? Um, is it ever achievable work life balance? Is it elusive? I'm not really sure. Um, it is probably why I, um, uh, you know, I only have one child and I postponed that for a long time because I couldn't figure out how do women do it? You know, how did they be wonderful parents and the most extraordinary parents? And I wanted to do the same. And, but you do, what is, there's a saying, right? That you hear every time you fly, put your mask on first and then you're able to assist others, right? Boy, that's kind of as a little metaphor that says it all. If we don't take care of ourselves, how can we do take care of those we love, manage our businesses, the things that we're passionate about? How do we contribute to community unless we take care of ourselves? And that is so easy to say and hard to do. What do I like to do to relax? I love to read something that is not related to economic development. Um, <laughs> and that's hard to carve out time to do. So my latest book, which, and read it before I understand it's streaming a movie, it's Lessons in Chemistry. Read it. It is phenomenal. I um, also, I think I have somebody, I bought a copy and, and two friends said, Leslie, you should read this book and send it to me. So I have extra copies I'll share. Um, uh, I'd love to read and I'm a water girl. I'm a Pisces. I grew up on the Mississippi River in Iowa, and um, uh, a lot. It was, you know, I looked out over it was very expansive. It was very wide there, but because it backed up uh, against a dam, and just beautiful. And you know, loved to swim and water ski and a boat there. And I was a swimmer. And lucky I don't go in the dark because I swam the Mississippi River. You know, I don't even <laughs> want to know what and what we um, swam in. So it's so lovely that we could sip a clear, blue, beautiful Pacific. I love to swim oh. so, and read. And there's nothing better than to take out my beach chair or my umbrella and crack up my good book and take a swim. What, do you, what advice do you have for when things start to get out of control <clears throat> and when these coping things don't always work the way you have planned them to? Oh, boy. And do we all need to practice that now? I am going through that now. Every day when I wake up, 
Oh my gosh, we have so much to do. How are we even going to make a difference? It's overwhelming. And you know, um, just realizing that we're human and we can only do as much as we can do and do the best we can and breathe and um, know that we're going to make mistakes, but we were well intentioned in what we did. There was nothing harmful in that mistake. It wasn't, you know, um, and um, ground yourself with good friends that care about you, that support you, that you can call them and say, oh my God, I think I just want that test. What am I going <laughs> to do? Or, you know, I don't know if I can take the test tomorrow. I'm freaking out. They'll come over. They'll, you know, bring you a cup of coffee. They'll, you know, bring you a piece of pizza, whatever <laughs> it is, talk you off the ledge. I really, um, I do rely on my friends and my family and my husband, who's like, has to be like the best listener ever. <laughs> um, even though he talks for a living, he has to listen to me. Um, so, so, and, um, yeah, don't isolate. I think that's the hardest thing when we're so overwhelmed and we're scared and we have too much to do. And, you know, um, isolation is not healthy. Be with those around those that, know you care about you love you and um because i'm worried right now i think that we have um we have tremendous mental health challenges right now for just everything that's happened and i'm worried about and we have limited mental health resources so most importantly ask for help don't isolate ask for help Thank you. That is a strength. Yeah. Asking for help, going to counselors is a strength. It is not a sign of weakness by any shape of that imagination. Okay. Can I ask another one? Sure. Um, it's going to be a little different topic, but um, you mentioned a lot about like mentors mm -hmm. uh, when you were making your way up the ranks. So I was curious, like, how would you recommend like to one of our students, like they would find a good mentor to help them grow? And would it have to be one that would be like for the profession or is it just like general? I think it's both. And I've had so many mentors, I can't even tell you from the tellers I worked with that I told you about to an illustrious woman of history to friends. You know, my daughter mentors me sometimes more than I am a parent to her. I think you've got to do both because you have to, I think you need a broader perspective from someone outside the profession that can just be there to give you just basic guidance of, you know, interviewing, mm -hmm. how to, you know, get through a career, what else you can do to just make sure that you have a broad sense of self. And um, for a, um, a mentor, I think you just have to ask. And um, I think that the best attributes of a mentee, when I've had the honor to be a mentor, is I want someone that will engage with me, that's not afraid to ask questions, that won't just be you know shy and just want to listen. I want them to challenge me to ask questions, that not afraid to do something because you might not know how to do it perfectly. I would never give a mentor someone that they something that they could blow up, you know. I mean, a mentee. <laughs> Um, I might give them, I give them something I hope that will challenge them and stress them, but you know, I'm not going to give them a grant application that's due tomorrow that they could screw up. Just like I'm sure in the lab, you're not giving anything that could be hazardous. So, um, without supervision. So I don't know if that's a, an analogy or not, but yeah. So I think, um, be engaged because what's going to happen if it's a good mentor or mentee relationship. The mentor is going to learn as much from you as you're going to learn from them. Thank you. What were some things maybe that a mentee has taught you? Um, well, I told you I had to learn from a mentor procedure. I fought it all the way, and that it has served me well. Um, uh, uh, learning how to say no um, is what a mentor taught me. It is so easy when you're smart, like all of you, you're, you know, committed to doing something, you want to do greater good, you have these great aspirations. It is really easy to spread yourself so thin and um, which is not healthy physically or mentally. So um, learning how to say no um, when it's not the right timing 
do so graciously and, you know, be um, very humble and thank for the opportunity that you've been asked to do it. Maybe at a later time right now, you know, I can't give, I don't have the time to do it justice or the project to be as deserving as the time I'd like to commit. So you always want to keep that door open. Um, I think that is, that was, you know, the greatest lesson that I learned. And you don't have to be a perfectionist. I think, and I think this is gender, um, and maybe it's just for my era, not your Zelly. But um, girls tend to want to be perfectionists at what they do. And um, a mentor once told me, perfection is the enemy of good. So do your best. Don't be a slacker. That's not the message I'm trying to impart. Do your best. Do a great job. Um, but, you know, um, don't overthink it. Don't, you know, over process it. Perfect. So just, um, so, yes, remember, perfection is the enemy of doing good work. Okay. Learned that this summer, actually, I had my first like internship, and my boss wanted something done, and I was like sitting there thinking, "Oh, how can I do this? I want it to be right." And he's like, "Oh, are you done?" I was like, "Oh, I have something, but I'm not done with it." He's like, "No, it looks fine. Let me just see." And it was fine. I think sometimes a lot of, or actually a lot of times, we tend to get in our own heads about what's good and what's not good enough. But yeah, just yeah. pushing through that. Pushing it's, like, um, it's like, um, you know, a lot of young women that would make fine engineers and um, are in high school and maybe they don't get the top grade and AP calculus, they think, oh, I can't go into engineering. <laughs> you know, and it's like, I think a B, a B in AP calculus dean will get you in for the College of Engineering. So yeah, it's a very good grade. <laughs> So it will, it's a very big great. So don't think you have to be the top, the top A. Um, this um, to be an outstanding student and a fabulous candidate for engineering school and a fabulous professional engineer. Um, because uh, you all have that capacity and we need you. Um, kind of piggybacking off of that. Um, when you are a mentor, what are you kind of like focusing on? That you want to like instill in your mentees, like, what do you want them to kind of gain out of that? Confidence, you, confidence, absolutely confidence. Um, because I um have the great privilege of writing a lot of um, I guess letters of recommendation mm -hmm. for our STEM work students, which is the K through twelve pipeline that we do at MEDB and um uh, for for college. And um, so I usually ask them to give me some bullet points of what they want me to say, because they have teachers that talk about their academic performance. You know, they may have a community leader, if they were a Girl Scout, a Boy Scout, or a religious person who talks about that. But what, you know, what can I say that gives a unique look at their great talents? And so what they give me is... It's beautiful that it's cultural because one of our greatest cultural, I think, things that, what is the phrase, don't make big body, right? It's not about you, it's about the team. You share the accolades, you share the, you know, um, you share the honors with the team and you don't take it on, you don't try to let it yourself. So I think the biggest thing I do is put superlatives in some of those letters and say, there is a time to say, that you have mastery of something. There's a time to showcase that you have exceptional skills or an incredible dedicated passion. So to my mentees, I try to instill when we exhibit our beautiful cultural values of sharing and not taking the limelight and sharing the, you know, all the accolades and everything. But there is a time when you have you have these skills, you have these talents, you have this specialness. It is, you can say it and you can show it and won't be confident in that um, uh, here at the College of Engineering or in the um, workplace. You can fit in and you can excel. That's the one thing that I see with our young people is to, and then especially if they choose to go to the continent to go to school or to work, 
Um, you know, there's uh, our young people can compete with anyone and bring a specialness and exceptional excellence, this balance of um, culture and science that can teach the world, quite frankly. So, you know, there should be no intimidation um, in your work that I hope it doesn't. I hope your work takes you here. I've already tried to make that pitch. But if your work, your life takes you to the continent, grad school, whatever, um, know that um, you can hold your own. In fact, you have much to teach. So a lot of us are students right now. Um, from your perspective, where does education fit into the big thing? Education opens the door. There is no question about it. It is the portal to entry. Um, when you walk across the stage in um, May of 25, were you, is that right? Mm -hmm. so you guys are about third year, right? May of 25, we're close around there, a semester close to that. Um, uh, you have already gone from this list here of resumes to this layer in the list because, you know, there's no question at all, you know, we're trying right now to have hiring managers take a look at minimum qualifications and does it need a degree? Can it be done with a certification? But in the end, an education is what opens the door. And then it's up to you with your experience, your work ethic. Yes, industry certifications. I'm all for the and, not the or. I think it's a degree and industry certifications. Um, it's your uh, recommendations, your internships, but it's the education that gets you to the door. And the most important thing is um, education is like a little living laboratory for you that you can test those critical thinking skills. You can test your hypotheses. You can test working with other people. And um, you know, it's it's, you know, it's um, you know, it's a time for trial balloons and without major consequences, you know, we have a our billing to contract and have a deliverable for some one morning in the workplace, you don't quite get that opportunity to experiment as much and on honing your own skills. So enjoy it now because it's a, it's a special, special time in life. I know you're working your butts off third year, ooh, engineering, but you know, it's a special time for you to grow you. You know, I think college is when you just seemingly get to focus on you and that's what it's supposed to be about. Um, that, you know, other priorities in life come later that, you know, you have to remember to focus on you. So, um, so anyway, Enjoy. When you talk about like how we're growing ourselves right now, um, for like an aspect of like mindset, what do you think is one of the most influential or like powerful beliefs you had in your mindset or you develop that like got you this far? You would say. Um now um and it's probably came from my parents. I always saw that they wanted to give back and they always felt that contributing community and volunteering time and if they had resources. So I think my mindset that I know that I'm always well intended in what I do. You know, I always want to do something purposefully, I guess purposefulness. I want to do something that will help, that will contribute, that will move the dial, will bring in resources that will um, help people and even though I may mess up even though I may you know not get that grant that I you know put everything I have into it I know I did it with purpose and well intendedness to make a difference and make a contribution I think that's why um, I've enjoyed working in a nonprofit um, so much I think the saying is uh, I've enjoyed making a living while I felt like it made a difference. A question about when you first moved here, yeah. what, what kind of doubts <laughs> did you have to push away in order to feel like this is where I'm meant to be? What kind of made you feel like 
was there like a moment where you you kind of knew this is what you're supposed to be doing you know <laughs> um it didn't come immediately because you know I think our when as you my crazy way I got here <laughs> I think unconventional I guess is like a euphemism for that my parents had other words for it um <laughs> that um I I just wanted to not take advantage because you know you see so many transplants I think come and take and um not give and a Kapuna once told me that you know if you're meant to be in Hawaii or not, because if you're meant to stay here, the waves keep gently keeping you as this is your home. And if you aren't here with the right heart, the right intentionality and purpose and mindset and values, something is going to, you know, pretty much interrupt and wash you away. And um, I have seen that happen a lot. And um, so, it took a while because, you know, I was from the Midwest and, um, you know, I, I uh, took a while to learn pigeon. Um, <laughs> it took me a while to, but I always love that we're so lucky because we're so embraced by so many, our families, obviously on the continent. I was lucky my parents were older and you're in retirement. So, you know, they got to come spend some time here with us. So I didn't feel we were too isolated from our family. Um, but um, you just always, I, I love being open to new ideas, new people, new things, new culture. So I think that was a thing that made our um, feeling like mine was home where other people never feel like it's my home. They get the island fever or, you know, they don't feel comfortable. They can't. You know, they think about the house they could buy on the continent versus the house they or where they can live here. Um, I always just love learning more. That was what, you know, learning new cultures, new people. And I think I got my pigeon down. <laughs> Close to the end here. What, I, what? Do you want to make a, your, an announcement? Yes, I do have an announcement. Thank you. So um, I have an invitation. So I didn't do the traditional PowerPoint. Um, I could have done about the wonderful things that MEDB does and I'm so proud of everything from internships for you to um, helping. I, I always tell Dean that we try to be his pipeline um, through our Stemworks programs. We're you know, in uh, 51 schools now in every island across the state helping to um, build that that kind of thinking and problem solving and the next generation of engineers that represent the beautiful demographics of our state, including 50% girls. Um, so in, because I didn't give you that big fancy PowerPoint, of which I'm happy to send you slides. I'm inviting you, um, we will all stay in touch with Dean and um, to Maui for a tour at the Maui Research and Technology Park, uh, which is where our home is. Um, I think that anchoring industry that is happening there is the space economy. This is the time for the space economy for the recent commissioning of Air Force Research Lab into the Space Force and all the money that's going into developing that new branch of the military, which is domain is lower Earth orbit, right? And all the tracking that goes on uh, to look at all the junk that is up there so that our assets that are working that we need are safe and you know just one tiny little something can take out a major asset and we would love to give you a tour we'll help with travel um, we'll help introduce you to some of the companies that are there that are doing phenomenal things in space situational awareness and space domain awareness and opening up the data catalog of what's up in lower Earth orbit. We're in an interesting time when uh, the Department of Defense is gonna track things for military, but commerce, um, the tracking of all the commercial stuff that's going up there now is gonna um, go under the Department of Commerce. So how that, you know, that transition and tracking and collaboration and data sharing, we're right at the cusp of all of that which will require a lot of engineering talent. I will tell you, on Maui right now, the supercomputer probably has 12 computer engineering jobs open, computer science jobs. I'm sure rebuilding 
our renewable energy will have huge jobs open. Um, aerospace engineering, which I understand is a focus of mechanical engineering here, right? Um, is private care space. Uh, we'll hire as many as the Morioka graduates and who want to come to Maui. And um, the last time I saw what uh, Alex Fielden offered someone to come work at private care space, right out of Purdue, got to focus in here at UH, was 160,000 starting salary. Now, yes, Maui's more expensive and yes, there's less housing and yes, you may not have family there to live with your first three years until you pay off your college loans. But, you know, don't, don't yeah. underestimate, don't look at the neighbor islands. I know PMRF has a lot of jobs also on Kauai, Kauai Island. So what I'm saying, don't ignore the neighbor islands. And I would love to do like a career awareness field trip, whatever you want to call it. Um, maybe it's like spring break a good time or you can winter work, break. You can work something on. Yeah, I we'll bring it over. We'd love it. So I'll, I I had the opportunity to showcase some of the companies to Dean Maroka and uh, Vice President Masillas. And uh, it was a good day, right? Yeah, so Fun nice. group of people, as well as very brilliant and amazing technology and adaptive optics and sensors and all kinds of stuff. And then the last thing I'll leave on when you ask me about values. Um, clearly, I am humbled to live in a state that has the most incredible indigenous population that has some of the most sophisticated solutions in land management and um, tracking and looking to the heavens. And um, as you know, some of our assets that anchor our technology growth on Maui are on sacred Haleakala. They're the telescopes, right? The University of Hawaii has Science City up there and now Space Force rents space from the UH for the AOS telescope. So honoring culture and the sacredness of Haleakala at the same time having a place for the advanced, most sophisticated instruments that are state-of-the-art for our young people to then uh, make a contribution to that science and to get more Native Hawaiian students in this field is my passion. So I believe our values, which are my personal values and the values of my organization are that we must, we will, is our honor to honor the values and traditions and the knowledge of Native Hawaiian post culture at the same time still advancing science. Um, they are not mutually exclusive. In fact, they inform each other and uh, you are the future of that. Thank you very much. So everyone's been uh, joining me and thanking Leslie. I mean, I think you can see why I just love this woman and value her opinion on the Dean's Council as thank always. You. So thank you for joining us today. Thank you. Uh, for everyone else, you know, thank you for joining us as always. Um, our next seminar series is November 3rd uh, with Kiana Yamat from Hensel Phelps and Melissa Humphreys from Layton Construction. So two of our younger alumni, uh, women in the construction industry. So they're gonna give their perspectives on, on UH and their, their careers um, as females in the construction industry. So I'm very much looking forward to that. And then we're actually gonna wrap up the year, uh, December, is it December 1st? The last, December 1st, I think, we actually have the privilege, as you, as you all know, we always talk about how we appreciate the sponsorship of the Ken and Donna Hayashida family for sponsoring this. Uh, Ken Hayashida is going to be our guest speaker um, to wrap up the, the 2023 year. So very happy to have that. So again, thank you, everybody. Have a great weekend. Um, and